Hello everyone, my name is Gabriela Zucchi. I am part of the Aarhus University in Denmark. I'm working in a joint project with the University of Turku, Turun Liopisto, and also in Finland. And also I'm part of the Brazilian research program in biodiversity, this Pepe Bio, being a researcher there for more than 10 years. And today we will be talking about soil databases. What are the pros, what are the cons? And I hope by the end of this presentation, you are all convinced that soils are very important to be taking into account to have more complete and meaningful ecological niche models. So this is probably one of the most used figures in ecological niche models presentations and courses. Uh, when you, the ecological niche models are now a common place in conservation biology and in several other fields where you have few data, so occurrences, and several layers, environmental layers, and from that you will use some algorithm to model the response curves and project the response of the species in relation to the environment to a surface, to an area where the species occur. Recently, this approach has been applied also to evaluate the habitat distribution in the, of the species in the future. So basically, instead of projecting the response curve to the current environmental conditions, the environmental layers used now in, in for this approach are uh, uh, climatic scenarios for the future. So nowadays, it's very common to use 2050 or 2030 that are the, the, the layers that are most commonly available. Nonetheless, I guess at this stage in this course, you have been seeing many examples of ecological niche models and species distribution models. And you may have noticed that most of them are focused on climate niche, climatic niche of the species. Soils are rarely incorporated, which is pretty surprising from my point of view, because we, all know that the plants are a function of several factors, for example, light, temperature, uh, viability of water, and one very important aspect are the nutrients that comes from the soil. And plants depend on the nutrients to grow, and they are plants are also the basis of the food web. So they also influences the productivity of the ecosystem as a whole. So soils are important to be considered not only for plants, but also for many animal groups. If soils are so clearly important to predict the species distribution, but still they are rarely incorporated, why is this situation? Why we don't see soils often in the literature often being taken into account. And there are two possibilities here. Let's think that it may be that in some area or some research or based on some previous studies, uh, the researcher decides that actually soils are not so important. They play a secondary role. But it can also be that they are important, but they are difficult to be taken into account. And that's just the, the main reason why they are not being incorporated. So they are especially complex and, and they are more difficult to find proper layers to be uh, uh, used as input into the models. So let's see these two possibilities. Okay, so first, when thinking about these two possibilities, the first idea that soils are rarely incorporated because they actually play a secondary role. That can hold maybe, but especially if you it will depend a lot on your scale. If you think in a global scale, there is a non-gradient of diversity that is rela strongly related to, to temperature seasonality that goes from the tropics towards the poles and the richness of species decrease uh, from uh, equator line to the poles. All right, in this sense, soils maybe in, at that scale for this question may play a secondary role still. There may be re, uh, smaller scale variations that even if that's the case, you the taking soils into account can be a, a way 
to demonstrate that they really play a secondary or no role at all. So it is still worth uh, considering the soils. On the other hand, there are plenty of evidences from the literature and accumulated knowledge demonstrating that actually soils are a very strong candidate of a variable that explains the species distribution in, at many scales and around the globe. So it's not a new, any, any new knowledge since, for example, just as an example, it was published in Nature in 1923. And you have examples from Amazonia, you have examples from China, Tanzania, from any, uh, basically every place in the globe you will find examples of studies showing the relationship between species uh, growth, abundance, diversity, and, and the soils. Therefore, we can agree that models that don't take into account soil layers, they are conceptually weak and incomplete. Even if you get a high, high score like AUC or whatever you are using to evaluate your model, conceptually, if you just don't include soil, you can argue that it's incomplete. Let's move beyond this idea that soils are not so important, that's why they are not taken into account, and let's think in the second idea that it's actually they are important, we know they are important, but I just don't know how to incorporate the, the soils into my models and that's why I've been skipping those. And that's a good argument because in, at, if at one hand you have plenty of uh, climatic models pretty easy to use that you just download and you run or even uh, in R packages that you have online, you have good tutorials. Also, the for example, the World Clean has been published almost 15 years ago, so there have been a lot of improvement also because the models had a lot of problems in the beginning, but the more demand, the better the models and so on. So while the climatic models, you, have a, you probably had a very good class with Dirk about the Chelsea models, so while the climate models, climate variables are easy, relatively easy to be taken into account, soils are not that easy or at least they were not that easy because until recently there was no uh, really meaningful global level soil map available and easy to use for ecologists or for some person that it's not really a science, soil scientist. But now things are changed so I will start talking a bit more about what are the possibilities and how to work on with this uh, layers in this slide you can see that uh, it's a snapshot of the soil grids that I've been talking a lot from now on. And you can see in the list, in the right side of the slide, that there is a long list of variables that can be used. And some are meaningful for a, for a plant. From the po plant point of view, some are not. So let's think a bit on w which are the relevant variables that can be used. So now we are really starting the class, what we are going to talk about today. Today we will discuss a bit on the concepts, what are the soil characteristics. We will also go into the practicality, so as I said, an overview of the available layers and how to work with those in R, very briefly, very short. So just a start to start with, and we will see some examples on the incorporation of soils, in, published examples of uh, papers that took soil into account and how they improved the models and so on. And my goal here is to that after this class everyone is convinced that soils are important to take in, into account and it's possible to be taken into account. So give you tools to incorporate soils in ecological niche models. So a bit of concept, what is soil? So far we have been talking about soil, 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 but what do I mean when I'm talking about soil? Soil is a source of nutrient, nutrition for the plant. And in the soil we have many characteristics. We have the chemical characteristics that are the concentration of certain nutrients, macronutrients or micronutrients, but also, for example, uh, how much the concentration of the acids, because the acidity of the soil influences if these nutrients are or not available for the plant to absorb it. In 
some areas that the soil, the concentration of the nutrient is high, but the pH is such that the plant cannot absorb through the roots. And you also have the physical characteristics of the soil. So, for example, very sandy, very clayey, these are the, the texture of the soil, that those are physical characteristics. And it, it influences, for example, drainage capacity of the soil and also the capacity of the plant to, to establish there physically. Okay, so these are the things we are mainly discussing when we say soil. Chemical characteristics that are things that you can go to the field and collect soil and measure directly and go to a lab and know how much soil, uh, how much zinc or potassium or magnesium is there in that soil. But there are also the, the soil types, these global classes that, and this is an example of a map of the global soil regions. These are polygons, this is a polygon map with the main soil type of each of these regions. But of course, it doesn't mean that all the soils that are mapped there are from the same soil type. Because in a smaller scale, the soil can variate and, in, and they can actually variate a lot. And it, it's always related to, ge to the geological evolution of the region. So it's also interesting before uh, studying an area and uh, trying to think about the species distribution, think about the landscape evolution of this area. Here we have two good examples of how soils uh, can vary in a smaller scale according to the geological setting of the area. One is more in, in different geological times. So in the first example, this beautiful mountain, colorful mountain, uh, I have, if you were wondering why there is this cake in the figure, you think about a cake that was formed by layers and then at some stage you cut and due to tectonics, for example, this cake is turned. So then that's how you see the, soils variation, the soil variation uh, in a small scale. So it's because you are actually walking through different time scales of, of the formation of the, that soil. So this is one source of variation to the soil. The layers were formed in different contexts. For, uh, to give an, a, a practical example, in Amazonia, at some stage, the Western Amazonia was covered by a lake. So the sedimentation of this lake formed a layer at, of thin uh, sediments. And then when the, the lake was drained, other more sandy um, layers were formed. And then when you tilt these, you have some very clay fine fine sediments and then you have more sandy sediments in a small scale quite abrupt change and the second example is uh, quite typical also in many places of the world is a variation along what we call a catena it's a topographic variation where some kinds of sediments are deposited on the bottom and other kinds of sediments are uh, present in the upper part and along the slope, you may have this gradient also. So as you can see, to map soils, you need to have some sort of detailed information on the area. And until recently, there were very few good maps at these smaller scales. This is an example of a soil map that was already available a long time ago. But you can see it's very coarse. You have only four categories of the nutrient status of the soil, so not really relevant to species distribution models. I'm giving examples in the global level. Uh, it's quite, it's very common that at national level, at country level, uh, there are much better maps of soil available than those examples I'm giving because the soils are very relevant information for the government to plan land use, for example, plan crops and, and occupations and so on. So usually there are initiatives at the global level, uh, at the national level, sorry. But not always uh, national level maps are interesting for species distribution models because the species doesn't follow borders or country borders. Okay, so this is a soil map or actually uh, soil types 
of Brazil, made by the Stat Geography and Statistics Brazilian Institute. It's a variable, and you can see that it's much more detailed than the examples I've been giving before. So it might may be useful for some uh, purpose. Uh, so uh, before thinking about uh, searching for soil layers, also check what is your area and what uh, if there are initiatives that are not global but are uh, in a local. It can be state or or a project that is has been studying more in depth the soils of the, a certain area. For me, it's not useful, for example, this kind of map because Amazonia is a biome that it's cross countries. So, so to, to deal with species that are have a distribution around the whole Amazon, the basin of Amazonia, it's not uh, important to use this kind of national initiative. But that's case to case. Let's now go into an in initiative to provide soil maps at the global scale in an easy to use format that is you can download the shape files so this is the soil grids so that soilgrids.org i encourage you all to go there to this website and navigate it's easy to use user friendly and you will see a bar with the possible layers that you can either visualize and also download and use in your research project Soil grids is a variable in 250 meters pixels or resolution, so it's a relatively good scale for most of the species distribution model modeling projects that uh, researchers are interested. That's a good scale to think about. And another feature that is interesting is that if you click in a point, like I'm showing in this slide, it will give a profile of the soil in that exact point that you that you were choosing. So you can use also to build intuition about your study area in relation to the soils and think about how this variation can influence based on what you already know on the organisms you are dealing with. It was done based in several thousands of input points. Each input point means a soil uh, sample that was analyzed in a lab and or or evaluated in the field and you can see that has a pretty good coverage global coverage but also you can see that it's very uneven sampling so let's see what are the variables that soil grids have modeled uh, in a global level so we have the site characteristics for example the depth to bedrock and the soil organic carbon stock you have the physical soil characteristics that I talked a little bit before, sand, silt, uh, and clay, and you also have bulk density. When you move to chemical soil properties, you have the cation exchange capacity. That's one that I will discuss a bit more in depth because it's one that is being used already in some species distribution models and that may or may not be adequate depending on some context of the area. I will talk about this soon. And you have the carbon content. You have the soil pH here measured uh, in water. And I also wanted to draw attention that you have in... This is a 3D model, so it's uh, measured in several depths. So it's all, another thing to, to think is what is the... If you're working with a plant, if you're working with trees, or if you're working with an understory uh, plant, or if you're working with a grass, how deep goes the, the roots, or if you're working with an animal it, that, uh, that, is, that eats fruits of big trees, for example, so what is the appropriate depth to, be, to select? Finally, we have some soil classification based in two criteria, and they are... They, can be used as a proxy because they are actually soil types, but they don't say about directly uh, about the nutrient concentration, for example, of the soil. But in some areas, you can have strong correlation, so they may may be interesting to use. To summarize, this is a list extracted from the paper that explains how soil grids were developed of the variables that are available there. And also you have the codes, the, the, the codes that are the legends. When you download the layers, we are going to see it uh, quick uh, soon. 
you will see this, for example, this RCDRC and what it means. I want to draw attention in this table that there is the amount of variation explained in soil grids 250. Soil grids was first developed into in one kilometer resolution and then fine-tuned to 200 meters resolution and you can see that the amount of variation explained varies a lot so not all the, the variables were got a really a good prediction in the map. Also it's important to pay attention that even though many of them, most of them actually, has very good uh, variation explained, for example 83 percent you think oh that's perfect but it's also very variable from region to region in the globe. You can see that for example USA has a really good amount of input data points and then there are broad areas that are that have very few points. So these 83 percent it's a global average, it's a global uh, measure but it, it's, it doesn't mean that in, in your study area that's the resolution, that's the amount of variation that it's indeed uh, explained by these models of soil grids. As you saw, there is a long list, there are many options, there are many variables that can be used. And how do I choose? What is important to take into account? There is no single answer, because it may vary from area to area, but some good candidates, general uh, advice here, are for example the SEC. SEC and PH, and I will explain both because they are quite uh, strongly related uh, conceptually. So SEC, it's important to take uh, into account one detail here. SEC is cation exchange capacity. It's not the concentration in the soil, but the capacity of the soil to retain these exchangeable cations. That's a small different difference that can be a big difference in many cases and I will show you so soon why. But pay attention because if you say uh, cation exchange concentration or if, if you say cation exchangeable capacity, both will be SEC, the acronym. So when you are reading a paper, take into account, try to, to understand if it's the capacity or the concentration itself. When we are, we are talking about capacity, if you see this slide, you see this brown thing. Is let's say it's a grain of clay. The rule it usually works so that the sec is a good proxy of nutrient concentration also. So it is a good measure of of if the soil is rich in nutrients or poor in nutrients. This exception is when the soil has a lot of aluminium or hydrogen, so acid soils for, exam for example, they are acid because of hydrogen. So in this case the, the slots, or sorry, the slots are filled with hydrogen or aluminum, but not with plant nutrients. So you will have a high sec, but low nutrient concentration. So that's an important thing to take into account. If you're dealing with soils that are acid, then sec is not a good proxy. Thus far, I have already suggested two potentially good layers to be included in your models, SEC and also the pH. And what is interesting about using uh, chemical variables is because they tend to be global, glo globally interesting or at least in a large area. When you're dealing, for example, with texture, texture will be context dependent. So you can have rich uh, nutrient-rich clays, you can have nutrient-poor clays, but usually if you have, for example, a catena, that I already explained what is a catena, it tends to be that in the more clay areas you can have richer soils and in more uh, sandy areas you have more poor soils. So you can have this uh, strong correlation, but it it will depend on the geological history of that certain area. So it's it's not a general thing that you can use in many areas and across areas. The chemical is more it's the the it's the direct uh, variable because it's the thing that is influencing the physiology of the plant directly. Let's move a bit to okay how to do that. How can I incorporate those layers into my models? And now we are in R. I 
think you have seen are before in this course along this course. So the first two lines are relatively simple. You have to install this package called GCIF, Global Soil Information Facility, and then you use the second line library to call the package. So, so kind of turning on the package. First install the package and then turn on the package. Next step is a bit more complicated, but it's still not so complicated. I guess everyone can at least follow. I typed every line separately, but it's there are ways to type together, install all the packages together, but I want you to see. So line, lines 1, 2 and 3, you have three different packages that will be useful. The GCIF that we saw before is the one that deals with the soil, but the other ones they help to deal with spatial uh, objects because here for species distribution models we have to inform R that these objects are spatial objects. So once you install the new code, the, the three packets that are mentioned there, I will just do a very very simple demonstration of how to get a layer and, and how to extract points. So it's actually not doing the modeling but just that you get a feeling of what the layer is. So you create a data frame, so that now I'm in line 9. I will create an object called points or PNTS. There is a data frame and I the two uh, columns there are a long column that it stands for longitude and the two lo longitudes that I just randomly chose are minus 70 and minus 60. And then the latitudes that I chose are both in the equator line 0 and 0. And then I gave the IDs, the n n names P1 and P2, point 0.1, point 0.2, very simple. So then I tell R that this object is actually a spatial object by telling that long and lat are actually coordinates. And those numbers refer have now uh, are georeferenced. And I need to um, tell what is the projection that was used, so the datum. And this is the line to do that. In Amazonia, in most of the, the geographical coordinates use this projection. Now we have the points and we can actually use the layers. So I had already downloaded before in my uh, computer this layer called, if you read the whole uh, number 14 line, you will read that the file is a TIFF, it's a geo TIFF actually, that it's OSHTA clip it 2 because I pre-processed by clipping for the uh, only the Amazonian area that I'm interested because it would be too heavy to work in the, in the global scale uh, but still possible. It's just that I was not interested and I had very many layers. So I call this um, as a raster file, which means that it's also georeference. So R will understand using this raster command that so my object soil grids is a raster file. So it's a layer. It's ready for to be included in a in a species distribution model, just like the Chelsea layers are, just like the uh, bioclimatic layers from World Clean are too. So in this sense, it's now uh, easy to incorporate, just like as the as easy as the climate data is. And to give an example here, line 15 and 16, I'm just plotting, and I will show in the next slide that I'm first plotting the soil grids object that I created. So it's actually the layer, this OSHTA, that I will tell what is that. And then the second line, I plot the points. And that's why I need this add equals T, that stands for true. So I have both plotted in, the, in one single frame. And finally, I can, uh, that's just to visualize. And then line 16, or sorry, 18, 19, and 20 is to show how you extract the values 
So you will see what are the values of my variable, my soil variable in those two points that I that I'm asking that I created in my as my PNTS object. And the values are 75 and 71. So the OSHTA stands for organic carbon matter or stocks, sorry. And I will show other uh, variables that are in soil grid soon. Sample plot that I did using that code. You have the scale of organic carbon stocks and the two points that we created together. that I want to tell in this more hands-on part is this table that is actually much longer but that's why there is the link here so you can see what are the variables that are in soil grids what are the, the codes and a description the mapped units and a conversion factor to get back to the original value and the units so we have just here the, the cation exchange capacity of the soil that we have been discussing quite a lot, the SEC and clay and nitrogen and the pH measured in, in water, so the soil pH. And there are many other options. I want to move on to a study case that I will show about the importance of soil in predicting habitat distribution in the future. Study case. We will focus in the different, different models that we get once soil is taken into account in relation to models that are climatic only. So we were, we are, we were going to use 35 species as example of different plant groups. For each of these species, we run Maxent models playing with different features. So uh, changing the parameters in the mo of the model and comparing. But I will focus only on the results using climate-only models and climate-plus soil models. For example, when you take one palm species called Iriartea deltoidea, that is very common in Amazonia, it's usually found in western Amazonia, I can tell because it prefers uh, nutrient-rich soils, you can see that if you include only climate in the models, you get a totally different dis uh, expected distribution, or let's say the distribution of the habitat in the future, than if you include climate plus soil. Because looking in the, the four maps in the bottom of this slide, you will see that the ones that are clim climate only models, they predict a bigger habitats, bigger area of the, that this species can potentially occur because they are modeled basically only in soil, but in, in climate. But when you include the soil, and this species has a strong soil preference, this area that is climatically suitable for the palm species is actually have the wrong soils, have poor soils. So the species is uh, probably will not happen there. Of course, when we are talking about the future, we cannot say if the species will occur there or not because there may be change, evolution and other things. But if we map the habitat of the species using climate or climate and soil, you will get pretty drastic uh, different results. The habitat, the future distribution of habitats for several species, as I said before, 35 species. For every species, we established a threshold to determine, to transform the probability maps into binary maps. So if the species occur or not occur, if the habitat is suitable or not suitable. So zero and one, not uh, probabilities anymore. And with these binary maps, we calculated the area, the area that is suitable for the species, either in the present or in the future. And this was done both for the climatic only models and for the climate plus soil models so that we compared the changes in the area estimated with these two different sets of environmental variables. Too much into details, we can see here that the bars in red, so to the left, are the number of the species of the species where Climate-only models predicted larger areas than 
the climate uh, plus soil models. And to the right, these climate only models predicted smaller areas than the climate plus soil uh, models. Which means, for example, if the climate only models are predicting larger areas, it may mean that this species is actually very strongly restricted by soil. So if you don't take soil into account, you will overestimate the habitat of this species. My message is really clear. We can't uh, properly model most of the species distribution without taking soil into account. And nowadays it's not so difficult anymore. So I hope everyone is now convinced that let's go for it let's test all these or some of these variables you always need to to think what is the depth that is interesting for my organism what is the variable that is interesting for my organism what is the variable that better represent nutrient concentration in my area or any other edaphic uh, vari variation that is relevant to be taken into account so i don't have an answer to all the models, you have to include this or that. But I would say, for example, that SEC is a good one in many areas, but not in all areas. In my area, it's not a good one. And pH is, is also often very important. But again, in Amazonia, it was not a good choice because it uh, the variation is very small. So you have to know your organism and your, and your area very well. Just before moving to the take-home message, I want to make a little bit of advertising because I mentioned that in Amazonia, most of the layers doesn't work. So we actually uh, developed this uh, soil map. We used uh, plant as indicators of soil nutrient concentration. And, this, and the codes are already available in GitHub. And the, the, map, the map itself is available in Pangea, so you can just get the map and use, or you can refine the, the map, fine-tune it in a better resolution, for example. And this is where you can find this map and the methods. The method is published in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. So please take a look if you are working in Amazonia specifically. Consider this map as one of the variables to be included in your model. Guys, I guess the final message is very clear. It's really important to incorporate soils in ecological niche models. And to do that, we should evaluate the potential database at the global level. I've been talking about soil grids. At country level, there are many maps available, and that's something the researcher is responsible to, to try to find what is suitable or not and also evaluate what are the potentially relevant uh, variables, if soil type may represent something, if SEC represents pH, and so on. So thank you all for coming all this way with me in this video, and I hope you are having a great course.